Hey, Sean. Hey, what? How are you doing? Good, you? Yeah, not bad. I know things are a bit different here in the UK compared to you guys over there, but yeah, we're uh, fourth week lockdown now, so it is what it is, really, but how are things yeah, over there? It's the we're in Florida is the wild west, but it's there's. <laughs> I was in I was in California last week. If you didn't wear a mask into a place, you were looked at uh, oddly. And here, if you wear a mask, you're looked at oddly. Oh, really? Just flipped upside down. Wow. So obviously, yeah. with lockdown happening, um, I got in touch with a, a load of different people in the golf industry. Um, been a fan of yours myself was a good one to to sort of get at and it's been nice to sort of get people's backgrounds how they got into golf what they're currently doing um for obviously even club golfers to actually sort of watch and, and learn um now for yourself how did you uh, get into golf that's one thing i don't know um my dad took me to the range when i was about 10 and that's kind of that's how it started so I went to the range couple times then he got me picking balls at a driving range um that gave me the ability to use the range to practice pretty much every single every place that I grew up with in golf I had a job at so <laughs> it's I've been working at a golf course since I was 10 years old so obviously that's obviously gonna be a long time but what what age would you say coaching sort of sort of caught your eye uh well I, the thing is I had uh I had great, I had great mentors. So pretty much, I guess, where, whereabouts are you in England? Um, Doncaster, just down the road from uh, Sheffield, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Yorkshire, yeah. <laughs> the, the Northerners, I got yeah. you. Um, I know all about them Yorkshires and Sheffield guys. Um, yeah, you should do with Danny. Yeah, so pretty much the two guys who kind of raised me in golf in Canada were kind of like the John Jacobs of England. Yeah. So, you know, I pretty much was around them a lot and I watched them coach a lot. Um, I was just really into that. Yeah. Yeah. Just call you. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. I don't. But most of the things that I still do to this day, I probably started around the time I was 10 years old, but that, you know, I've just went deeper into it, but it's always been like a part of my life. Okay. So in terms of obviously, you'll have had some good memories and everything with coaching and we'll get into that, but what has been your best coaching experience? Something that sticks out for you? A few have struggled with this question. <laughs> well, it's difficult because I would say it's like different aspects so there's the business aspect so like great day business wise versus the aspect of kind of coaching and how it uh, somewhat validates the fact that we have a bank account in our soul mm -hmm. so do you know what I mean that the, there's the there's like the spiritual part and the business part um So I would say I started with this kid when he was 12, Mike Ligick. And uh, last year is the first year he made the PGA Tour after 18 years. Yeah, that's good. Um, I had a bunch of girls that started with me when they were 10. They all played. They all got to the LPGA and quit. Um, <laughs> they, they, I, I kind of made them well-rounded. So they got to the point and they were like, well, this is great, but this is not what I want to do for my life. And so that, right. that was I remember they thought I'd both be, they, they both thought I'd be upset, but I was like, of course I'm not upset. Like yeah. there's more to life than golf. Right. Yeah. yeah um, I completely agree. And then, you know, when, you know, kind of my first wins with all the guys, um, I've been fortunate enough to between the European tour and the PGA tour be a part of over 40 wins. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's what happens as time goes on. Like when it first happened, um, it was like a one week party, right? Yeah. <laughs> like every, every night, like, and I'm talking about like Sheffield style, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm Canadian, so we're not scared. All right. Um, right okay. 
And then, you know, it's like three nights and then it's one night and then it's like, you know, a half a bottle of champagne and go to bed and take your kids to football practice the next day. It's, yeah. I think as it's, 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 it's time moves on, I think as you get older, um, less things matter to you. And then the things that matter really matter. Yeah. You, you start realizing that you're not given like infinity to be on this place. So, you know, I'm 46 now. Um, that's not old, but that's only four years away from 50, bro. Um, <laughs> that, you know, I think 46 means I'm probably hitting my second shot into, into 10 if golf is eight, if life is 18 holes. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I, you yeah. just start to think, you just start to think a little bit think differently. differently you know? yeah. How old are you? Uh, 31 in a couple of weeks. Yeah, 31. So 31 was my first year coaching on tour. Right. And I can't believe I've been out there for 15 years. I mean, I just was at Tory Pines. Oh, it's, yeah, it's crazy. Um, yeah. So you got that point where you dream of this thing and you work towards it and then it happens and it's just like seventh heaven until you then realize what the thing actually is. <laughs> And then you realize, be careful what you wish for. And then, you know, you, you get hunkered down. You got some good players. They're all hungry. They're all young. Um, we're all kind of without families yet. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you got the family and then you kind of struggle being a dad and a husband while you're also focused on doing what you do for a living. And it's, so it's just, it just keeps changing. And so life, you know, life is a way of you, right? And so... Yeah you there's not much purpose in paddling you might as well go with the flow and so kind of you know now at 46 i feel like professionally on tour um i've done everything that i wanted to do um so it you know thinking of what's next or what does the next 10 years look like um uh, i haven't really got that far but you got to be careful sometimes in life that you don't keep doing what you're good at at the risk of not finding out what you're great at. So uh -huh. you can just, you can just keep showing up because, you know, people ask you to come out and you can just keep showing up and it's not yeah. the worst thing in the world spending a week in San Diego. Right. But I think as time goes on, you know, you miss more of your kids activities. You miss more things uh, that you can't get back. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll always be tournaments. So it's kind of a, it's an interesting balancing act. Yeah. So obviously guys who maybe not know as much about you, I know I'm a big fan and like the way you sort of go about your philosophy is what, what sort of, how could I word it? What shaped your way of looking at a golf swing? What was something that triggered you into how you go about it? Some people might obviously know you delve into numbers and biomechanics and All things like that. Stuff, yeah. 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 I... Was just, that just I'm something always, from the off that you, you just enjoyed? Just, you know, I just, I guess I just think differently. Um, <laughs> and, and then I've always been really smart at being, at having smarter people around me. So that thing, if you go, you go hang out with five people, you don't want to be the smartest one there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all the help that I've got from people in biomechanics and, physios the chiros uh physics professors you know i guess i've just always wanted to know why yeah uh, about everything about religion governments since i was a little boy i was like the knowing kid who, who grabbed his dad all the time and said like why is the sky blue why is the my dad said raising me he learned so much because i he had to figure out an answer <laughs> let's <me>. find out <laughs> He was like, what the fuck is this guy just thinks about this shit all the time? <laughs> um, people say overthinking. I, I don't know if it's that. It, I don't think it's really overthinking. Um, but yeah, just, you know what? I've been real fortunate to have a lot of smart people around me. Um, and then, you know, take what they say, what makes sense. But, you know, someone comes to you for a lesson. They're trying they to get the ball. No, they, oh, yeah. Yeah. They don't That's need it. to all that. Yeah. No, that's, that's always been that. That's always been the attitude is that they're just trying to hit the ball better. Mm -hmm. And so if you can, it's a tricky job because, you know, a lot of people come with where they're at because 
they're comfort freaks. They don't like to go outside their comfort zone. They don't change very much. Yep. Uh, and then you got to convince them to change the way they maybe hold the club and take it back and then kind of be there as an optimist as they struggle with being so uncomfortable. Hmm. So obviously going with that there then and, and sort of how you think about the golfers, do you still do much work with juniors, college players, sort of the yeah. younger? Yeah. Yeah, I feel like guys? it's probably it's probably much different now. Um, I think it 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 all used to be technique, yeah. technique, 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 and there's nothing wrong with that. There, there yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but you know, you keep kind of reading, you keep learning, you start looking into how the brain works start to look at the physiological systems of how oxygen travels through the body. There's all these things. And it's, I just think eight times out of 10 now, if, if I've got a, a player who's already a great player, the key to helping them improve is probably very little to do with technique. Okay. Um, once you get like with Danny, when Danny came to me, it was all had to do with technique. Right. Uh, just not good matchups for a golf swing, no pivot, so much radial, narrow, strong grip, no time to get rid of it, massive side bend to help. But also you've got a guy who's seventh in the world who won the masters, was a number one amateur in the world. Um, you know, Danny's nickname on tour was big time Charlie, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, that's great when everything's going your way. Yeah. But then we start, and he's 460th in the world. Body hurts. Just completely lost so much of his game. So, yeah, it is technical. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot more to do, a lot more to do with it than just technique. And that's why I think that a great coach in any sport could go and coach in every sport. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm sure if you were, if you were a, 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 a great coach and you went to the hockey rink, those guys are in the NHL. They know how to, they know how to play hockey. Oh, yeah. So how, how do you inspire them to get the most out of themselves when they don't want to be there? How, you, you know, how do you get them to create structure and a process and put in place uh, a level of training that they're going to be able to trust when they're under pressure. So obviously what you've just been saying there, obviously it's not always about the technique and everything. What bit of advice would you say to the younger generation of who do get fixed? I know definitely here around where I live of less and less and less and less and technique, 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 obviously performance games, things like that's good. But what would you, what would you advise them on to, to do? Yeah, I think it's a bit of everything, right? Mm-hmm. I think here's a, this would be real simple, right? So I think what happens is like players, when they're struggling, it's easy for them to lose kind of their love for the game, right? Yeah. And as you realize as a parent, if you didn't love your kids, you might put a pillow over their head. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> love, love, is, love is very important because what love does, love makes the good times great and makes the bad times doable and so we what we point to so much as mental I, I don't necessarily think it's that i think it had happens from here too um and so you know it's not rocket science have have, have you seen many great ball strikers not move their lower body not really yeah. have you seen many great ball strikers with a super strong grip and be like this in transition. Not really. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about great players. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about ball strikers. Yep. So if we just went and looked in the last few generations at the best ball strikers, we're going to see pretty big pivots. Yeah. We're going to see wrist segments almost at end range. It. That's it. <laughs> it's, it's not much more than that. So how can they use their pivot? 
and how how can they use their hands and arms, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one part. So say you get fixed in with a kid, they're 10 years old, they're really good athletes, and you kind of let them, you know, discover it on their own, but you kind of know where you're going to keep push them, right? Yeah. So there's people who've done those things and hit the ball great, but it just seems to me like take a lady you coach at the club who's 40 years old. Mm -hmm. If you get her to straighten her right leg, let her left knee work into adduction and get her slightly unweighted, keep her head not moving too much and then teach her how to stay wide. I mean, how much better is she going to get? Yeah. So much better. Okay. So much better. So I think the hands and arms are, are the GPS. I think they're the biggest deal. We are not talking about kicking a soccer ball. Mm -hmm. We're talking about swinging a golf club. It's an implement that's attached to our hands and that implement's not that heavy. So we have the ability for above and below the diaphragm to separate. We have the ability in each joint to create short stretch, shorten cycles, which is kind of what looks like that effortless power. So we have all these elastic aspects in us. We have all these recoils. Uh, we're using muscles to generate force and stiffen. Mm -hmm. It's not rocket science. That's why like when I see guys on golf blogs and it's like a massive argument, I'm like, but it isn't even that much of an argument. No. You could basically say if someone had decent balance in many different planes of motion, their hands and arms were strong enough, their hips were average, their thoracic spine had movement, and their shoulders were average, you could have a PGA Tour player. Mm. Of course, we see Dustin and Rory and Cameron. Yeah, Chan yeah. And like just we, as we've been talking, I just got a text from Ann Van Dam. So I'm going to see Ann Van Dam on Wednesday afternoon. Good plan. No, she's an out of this world athlete. Mm -hmm. She could be Olympic champion in four sports, bro. <laughs> really? So you look at a player like that. They're known as for having one of the great swings in the world, right? Mm-hmm. Think about the beautiful swings, right? Ann Van Dam, Adam Scott, Rory, Cameron Champ. The real beautiful, beautiful swings, right? Those are all people who have unbelievable control, strength, and mobility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just absolutely. So everyone's vestibular system is not created equal. And so our balance systems aren't created equal. Yeah. And so Anne comes to me, she's not playing well. She doesn't like the game. Um, and it's kind of like, all right, well, it must be really suffocating to be known as having the best swing in golf when you're not really that good of a ball striker. Yeah. I mean, that's the discussion. That's the first discussion. And how long have you been with Anne now? Well, because, well, it's been a couple of months, but right. If you couldn't make the ball do what you want it to do most of the time and everyone tells you how great your swing is, then what's the relationship? Yeah. Right. No, no one, no one's going to give Lee Trevino style points. <laughs> no one's going to give Mo Norman style points. No. Right. I mean, it's amazing how people like, you know, Bryson was so outside the box and da, 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 da basically originally tried to swing like Mo Norman. <laughs> yeah. Got pretty good. Right. Lengthened his swing, created more torque in the ground, a little more vertical force and got the center of mass behind where it went up. And he was way faster. It's not rocket science. So that, that, that's kind of the, the thing. So think about that with a kid, right? So you kind of get them, you kind of get them to where, you know how he's going to swing. Mm -hmm. Then Monday goes on the golf course for nine holes, play the back tees with no woods. Because in my estimate, I, when I watch people practice, they don't hit enough long irons. Yeah, I'd agree and, with that. And if you can become special with a long iron, that's a massive advantage. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with that in terms of when people talk about the 100 yards and in and, and people get better and better at that. I would say if you are good from 180 to 250, you look at the guys on tour. I mean, Rory, for example, how good was he with long irons? And then you compare him with someone else, I don't know, and 200 ranked player in the world. I would say there's a big difference there than potentially the 100 yards and in if people looked at the stats. Yeah, Mark Brody said that from 30 yards in on the PGA Tour, it took 2.31 strokes to get the ball in the hole, right? Yeah. And from 100 yards, it was 2.7. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So look at the amount of people who put cones out at 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. I get it. Yeah. I, I, I get it, but we got to... We got to challenge like so much of what we do in any day is just a progression of these belief systems that we have that we've never really like went, hmm, why do I do this? Mm. <laughs> I mean, in anything, right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I would, so, I would say that the top end of the game, you can tell a, a difference in sort of your strokes gained wise as opposed to the shorter stuff. For sure. Yeah. Now, now for, Amateur golfers, I, I see so many pro-ams every year, right? Yep. They all want to drive it further. They want to drive. <laughs> but they, but they, they slice it pretty consistently. And then they get in the bunker and they make seven. <laughs> and so how do you improve your business? A lot of people think you improve it by just using big words. And maybe that helps um, people. But... If everyone starts walking around Yorkshire saying that Danny Cowell has taken six strokes off my game, mm. my game, my score. Yeah. Okay. I played golf and then I'm at golf all the time. No one has ever, when I've walked off the course, no one has ever asked me how good I looked at P5. Nobody. Never. Never. Doesn't mean I'm not into all that stuff. I get No, it. no, yeah, yeah, I get that. But what did you shoot? Right. So, and Van Dam, you give this girl a driver. It's astonishing. Amazing. She's amazing. Cameron Champ, the best driver on, in the, on the planet. It's out of this world, right? Okay. So you're both like 70th in the world. <laughs> so what, why is that? Where do we need to work? Why are you avoiding doing these things? Yeah, that's another thing. People avoid what they are weaker at. Whew, easy, bro. Easy. Mm. So easy. I mean, why do you think you go to the gym? And, but but I, when I was a personal trainer back in the day, and the guy who kind of mentored me, his, his only thing was, you can't bench more than you can squat. <laughs> right? But we go, you go in the gym and you see guys bench and they do all that. And, you, you know, you see these big upper bodies and these lower bodies that weren't nearly as big, right? Whereas the funny, yeah. thing, the funny thing is if it mattered that much to you and you wanted to be scientific, if, you, if they up the amount of legs they did, their upper bodies would get stronger because they release more growth hormone using their legs all the time. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So it makes complete sense on why you should do legs to make your upper body stronger. Everything is connected. Everything is completely interwoven, the whole thing. So, you know, they play the, the back tees, no woods. Um, the kids who really, you know, are into getting better, they'll come back after a month and be like, look at how far I can hit a three iron if I aim it over here and like turn it down. Great. Mm. Right. Most of the great things that Tiger Woods and Ben Hogan and Jack Nicholas learned, they learned on their own time, mate. They didn't learn it from anybody. Yeah. Right. That's probably accurate of anything. That's accurate of anything. So it's funny, like there's there's not a ox, there's not at Oxford and Harvard in the business school. There's there's no like ex billionaires who teach it. <laughs> there's billionaires yeah. who learned it and went, that's interesting. But I see it like this. So they had the principles, they had the understanding. But they went on a different avenue almost. 
Can, can you imagine? Can you imagine when Elon Musk and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates started telling people what they were going to do? Can you imagine what they were told? You're out of your fucking mind, right? Yeah. yeah. I guess I am. I, yeah. I, I, that's why. <laughs> The, the only thing would freak me out is if someone ever told me I was normal. I'd be so freaked out by that. Um, <laughs> so the, 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 the second day, I get them to go out, play nine holes of worst ball. So hit two balls off the tee, yeah, hit the worst ball. Yeah, I do that. It's good. Wednesday, have them go out with four clubs. Uh, Thursday, have them, uh, have them hit every regulation shot into a greenside bunker. Friday, have them hit it in the trees on every hole and try and make par. Like, mm. you got to be prepared, dude, to play the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and what I, we see over here, especially with, like, your handicaps of a junior is a scratch handicap with the go-to tournaments, and all of a sudden, n- nothing remotely near what they would be expecting. But well, that is that's probably because you're, playing your the home, home course. course. Yeah. Hey, if I go to my home course right now, I don't even need a laser. I know exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you, it, we, we got to improve people's ability to think their way around the golf course. And I know we're into this anti-thinking thing, but I mean, Nicholas and Tiger, but those guys made less mistakes than anybody. They hit mm. tons of, I mean, how many bad shots did we watch Tiger hit? Mm. We'll never see, we'll never see John Rahm and Morikawa and Victor Hovland hit it offline as much as tiger and phil yeah never but there i i mean what's the chances that any of them win five five majors like phil mm. tough go right True. yeah so yeah the, you you do those games so what happens i get kids they're kind of doing their drills right they're in their window of where we want them um make sure they stay on top of it and then they come back after playing those games for like two weeks and they're like coach um not good in wet sand and I struggle when I'm short-sighted and then you can help them with that and help their score. Yeah. Right. So obviously you mentioned Tiger. How was that getting the call? I assume a massive fan beforehand. Oh, of course. Dude. The yeah. biggest, biggest ever. Um, so how would that have worked? Obviously a fan and coach. How did you find that? I was kind of a fan of Rosie and those guys too, you know? Right. It, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's not. I'm not like a fan. Like, like I, I don't have any. I, I'm not. I'm not like. I'm, not got the I'm posters not, up on your wall. <laughs> no, uh, no. I, I, I'm not like a Celtic fan or an Arsenal fan. Like a fan fan, right? Yeah. I, I'm just like a fan. I'm a fan of a lot of people. Um, yes. But it's just kind of a saying. Um, yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was. That was a crazy time. I mean, I'd have. Sean O'Hare and Hunter Mahan and Justin Rose all starting to just form into incredible players. Uh, they had all the, they had all the resources, but mm-hmm. I feel like I really helped them all find a, a new level within themselves and found a new level within myself while doing it with them. Uh, and then I got the call and Tiger said, um, I'm calling you because I've watched you help three good players become great players. And I think it's really cool that they don't swing the same. They don't have the same ball flight. They don't have anything like that. Uh, and that's how it started. Nice. So obviously working with tour players event week, I know a few people got in touch with me to ask more how you go about with your players for tour week. Now I would imagine it's not a full, full, full change in the swing in tournament week, but how would you guys prep? Is there anything specific you guys do? Check. I think you, most of your work has to be done. Beforehand. Yeah. I mean, it, and it's a little different now with COVID and what have you, but, you know, these guys all have these, you know, they got these names all over their shirt. Well, those require time. Yeah. And so you go to tournaments, there's got things with this company, this company, this company sometimes, uh, Pro-Am. Uh, if they don the Pro-Am, they do the Pro-Am they do a dinner, they're doing something, right? So I think it's kind of just basically creating like your own little Bible. So for example, like Cameron Champ's Bible is that if he aims right and gets the ball position for it, he's not Cameron Champ anymore. Right. So we're always, we're on that like nonstop. Yeah. Um, 
in Cameron's case, we hit a lob wedge 50 yards, 55, 50, uh, 60, 65, 70, 75. And then we hit a sand wedge 55, 60, 65. So Cameron is a person who could literally do, he could spend his whole day from 80 yards in. Right. At least, at least 130 in. He's got to be from 175 to 350. He's got to be the top three in the world, no doubt. Mm. But if you, if you look at, well, just an incredible athlete, but this is like watching people talk about watching him hit driver, watching him hit five iron at a 240 yard par three and watching that ball like take off and land. It's crazy, right? It's crazy. So, but it's 130 yards in. So if we look statistically, if Cameron went to the golf course Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and had five hours of practice, so that's 15 hours, he could spend 13 from 30 yards in. Wow. I mean, if you, if you looked at Mark Brody's numbers, that's all you would do. Right. But that, that's the trick is someone who's at that point, one, don't like how doing it makes them feel. And two, they're probably not good at it because they probably don't like it. Right. So Brant Snedeker loves putting. Justin Rose learned that it was important for him to become number one in the world was to become a certain enough putter. But you know, I, don't, I, I think his, his enjoyment for putting has grown as he's become better at it, but he's still mm-hmm. going to go to the range before he goes to the putting range. Yeah, yeah. Brett Rumford's going to be in the bunker, no doubt. <laughs> yeah. Right? He's good. But th- that's kind of the thing. To me, that's his passion. He loves that. He obviously loves that. Okay? Mm. But going in the bunker and accentuating all these really extravagant, elegant wrist angles and changes in the, to do stuff probably isn't going to help your iron or driver swing. No. So it's tricky, right? Like, I, th- I think about like guys around the green who I would not have to get up and down out of the bunker to save my life. And I don't think I'd pick DJ or Morikawa or John Rom or Victor Hovland or Cameron, because these guys are like this a lot. And they're, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Now you look at the guys who are amazing in the bunker and you're not going to get them to the drive for you. It's so it's it yeah, yeah. obvious obviously to, to me something like Brett Rumford is a is the best in the world at bunker shots. But he definitely loves it the most. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For me, if I was playing pro, bunker would be hard work. I don't enjoy it at all. Okay. That would be that would be where I would where you don't have passion, you need discipline. That's where I just have discipline. And it's the, you're just not going to like everything you do. You might enjoy what you do, but you won't love every compartment of it. Mm -hmm. Some guys love going to the gym. Other guys despise going to the gym. The fact is you just go, whether you love it or you don't, it's good for you. Yeah, yeah, true. Right. So lockdown, obviously for us guys in the UK, bit of a bummer at the minute, lockdown, any advice or anything you tell people to do during lockdown? Like, we can't go to the driving range. We can't go and play. Is there anything that you would advise fitness or anything like that, mobility? Yeah, the, the lockdown is a strange thing. Um, I won't even get into the political aspects of it, no, but no. just the, just the, like, we had it here when this all started. And so... I had two kids, uh, two sons, so that was plenty to do, right? But I, I found that I spent a lot of time like looking into things because I finally had time, and I, I kind of confused myself a bit. I, I was like, I don't really think I need to know this. Uh, so it's the danger. It's a lot of time to think. Yeah. Uh, and then you can learn things that you then figure out and then you go try to apply them right way, but you don't see, you don't see the other side of them yet. And I'm talking about technical things, things like that. Yeah. 
but I mean, it's, it's probably a good time to think, you think to yourself, you know, how do you want, how do you want, you know, how do you want the next 10 years of your life to look? You got to have, you got to have a vision. Um, for me at times in my career, I've had like great years where I kind of lost what the next five to 10 looked like. And even though it was a great year, I still felt uncomfortable and still confused. So I don't think it's really about that. Um, I think it's about having purpose and having vision and okay, what am I going to do going forward? Uh, Because this is not, this is going to be reoccurring. Mm -hmm. It's going to be reoccurring. Um, All the previous ones have not worked. So let's just keep, let's just do it again. Cause I think this fucking time it might work. There's been no discussion on shit food that people eat, how bad our water supply is, how much radiation there is in the air from all these EMFs and frequencies, all these things. We got a family on our street, eight people, two people got it, six people didn't. They live together. How does it work? Yeah. Is it that contagious? Does Danny Cowell and all these young guys who are literally, for the most part, 99.9 times out of 100, having a sniffle and a fever for two days, and then they're, you went to work feeling worse than this before. You just made sure you didn't shake hands or say hello to people. Yeah. They're taking away our ability to go, okay, I'm Danny Cowell. I feel awful. I'm going to cancel my lessons. I just, I can't work which is what would normally have happened. Which is what normally would happen. And then you look at, you know, you look at the, the death rate in every major first world country is at 83 years old. And so you have people who are immunodepressed already. It, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know how the whole thing is, but I just don't see the same leaders in every country that have got us to this point are still there. Mm. So, you know, who knows how much more often it's going to happen. But, you know, obviously for coaches, if it's going to happen again, don't sit there two times from now bitching that you can't work. There's got to be something you can do. do. Yeah. You know, there's the Skillist app. There's there's things like that you could do. People can go in their backyards, right? Mm -hmm. Look. In times like this, someone's going to do well. Yeah, someone is going to someone is going to level up. So, you know that you can't just sit. You can't once you feel sorry for yourself. That's great. There's nothing wrong with feeling sorry for yourself. Once you do, you just move on. Okay, so what's what's next? Yeah, every every week for me is really funny, right? Because I'll I'll have a Sunday night where everyone's played pretty well and everything's good. And then they'll have a Sunday night where Friday night looked great. And then Sunday night, they've all shit to bed. And then you can, you can find yourself start to think, you know, where did I mess up? What do we need to do better? And you're like, you know what? If they just played well on the back nine, you wouldn't even having this talk with yourself right now. Yeah. So why bother going down this rabbit hole right now? And just accepting, I've got a couple of things in my career right now we're moving houses. I've got a couple of extenuating circumstances where it's going to be an issue. It is an issue. I just keep telling myself at some point it'll be over. There's nothing yeah. I can do. No, no. So it's, it's, you know, it, to me, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of that it's like, there's whatever situation I'm in right now, I'm going to have no control of situation. The situation is not a good situation, um, but I've had tons of bad situations. And at some point, when I was 26 years old, the shit that I was worried about, I don't even remember, Danny, what that is now. Yeah, yeah. I don't really remember. But at that moment, that was like all encompassing and, 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 and just a shitty year. But that's because I created it. Like it was going to be difficult one way or another but I was the one who made it really bad. Yeah. So that's what, that's, that's, that's what we do. You know, we, when the best things happen, we just cruise and you got to enjoy it. You got to enjoy it while you get it. But 
my feeling is most the other time life is life is hard, but hmm. it's beautiful, but it's, 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 it's hard. And a bit more of a positive like, spin. <laughs> what are you looking forward to this year? <laughs> What's that? A bit more of a positive turn. Is there anything that you're looking forward to this year? Any plans? Yeah, no. And, and, and just to, on that last point, it ain't about being positive. It's, it's about being honest and real. To me, positivity is like spraying cologne on dog shit. It, I, I, I don't think positivity helps, but I know negativity hurts. I know what makes things better. Uh, love makes things better. Yeah. Um, you know, relationships make things better. The, the things you enjoy doing. So for me, listening to music, you know, what am I looking forward to? I'm just looking forward to waking up tomorrow, but like, yeah. And dealing with whatever and just, but, but never, never losing gratitude. I guess some people, it, it could be semantics. When you use the word positive, it could mean gratitude, right? It's like, if most people spend all the time being grateful for what they have and how far they've come, rather than thinking about what they have not and where they aren't. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that to me is just that, that idea of, I'm looking forward to knowing that I don't really control a whole lot and knowing that at the end of the day, if you took everything away from me and I was only left with my wife and my sons, I could figure it out. So, like I said, what matters to you, you know, matters more. And what doesn't matter, it, and, and you'll realize it. You at your age at 31, at 31, dude, I had it sorted out. I figured it all out. I knew it all. And, and you'll always feel like that. And then as that, you start getting challenged by life, uh, you realize you didn't. You just got to go with it. You got you to go with the flow. So, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to really just the simple things, mate. Um, I don't like creating expectations in my mind because if I said I look forward to Lydia winning her first major, Cameron winning his first major, and Van Dam winning three times, Justin Rose yeah. getting back into the winning circle, Danny Willett having a, in contention with two holes left in a major, Alex Levy winning four times, Lucas Beregard, you know, I dream of stuff like that, but I also know that you only fall as low as you climb high, so I don't really try to climb that high. <laughs> right like it so everyone who i've got to talk to i know a lot of my clients sent loads of questions in i pick five <laughs> almost five almost go-to questions to ask the guys who's your favorite player of all time oh it's i mean tiger woods Ta yeah 100 percent I like and I like Lorena Ochoa a lot too. Yeah, yeah, she was she's very Flat. good. Yeah. Favorite club in the bag. I don't know how often you actually had to play. <laughs> I would during the quarantine I was playing quite a bit. Um, okay. But that, but that's more just like that's more just that's more just 18 holes, making sure that the beers are on ice, you know, <laughs> and they, we're, I'm, we're not grinding over three footers. I promise <laughs> you that. Um, favorite club in the bag, five iron. Any reason? Um, well, it's my favorite club in the bag to like teach with, because I think like seven iron still has enough loft that if you're swinging it, iffy, you can still look like you're doing it. Okay. But okay. I think five, five irons when the shit starts to show up. <laughs> <laughs> right then, out of bounds left, water right, your go-to shot to keep it in play. <laughs> <laughs> um, out of bounds left, water right, go-to. I'm, because, I'm, because I'm thinking more about out of bounds than water, it's so final. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I would advise myself to do is to aim at the out of bounds and curve it away from it. <laughs> so so th it's, it's, it's one to aim in the fairway and think about out of bounds. It's two to aim it out of bounds and think about the fairway. Yeah, true. Favorite course <laughs> you played? Uh, St. Andrews. 
Oh, nice. British. I, I know I know everyone up there is plated and, or, you know, but for me, just the nostalgia, the whole deal. So my dad's from Glasgow. Um, so, yeah, St. Andrews. Now, I've been to a lot of golf courses that I haven't played. Um, but PGA Which Tour, one would you I want love- to? Excuse me? Which one would you want to then? If there's one that you've not played but you've been? Which would you have loved to have played? Man. Mm. East Lake be- in a- East oh, Lake nice. in Atlanta. Yeah. I would say there's got to be some good ones to have chosen from there. Oh, there's too many in my head right now. Yeah. yeah. But the, the thing is that I was never, I was, I was always in love with learning the game. I was never really in love with playing it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I enjoy playing it. I, I got, I got okay. I was off of scratch, but I, it was very easy for me to just sit and practice all day or be in the pro shop talking to the pros about, the swing or it was that whole thing yeah no i like that i I mean don't get me wrong i still love playing but yeah learning about it's it's good very good Mm. favorite major you'd want to win last one that one probably the open championship oh you're sticking british good lad yeah probably just the open i i just I feel like my original understanding of golf was just that way because my dad, yeah, yeah. my dad was from Glasgow. But I don't know. I just think the Open Championship ends up being like the ultimate microcosm of life. You could be, man. We had we had five years where Justin Rose finished third or fourth, finished first or second when he went late early. <laughs> like, All right. Okay. So I remember one time we played. Uh, where was it? Liverpool. Where'd, where'd Rory win Hoy the Lake, last one? Where's Hoy Lake, right? Yeah. Rory won Hoy Lake, right? Uh, yeah, I think it was Hoy Lake. Yeah. Yeah, I, he had the, like, the pink shoes on, I remember. So, did Phil win there? What year we're talking here? Oh, man, they all just, they've all turned into each other. What around Liverpool where you've got Lytham, um, Birkdale, Hoy Lake. Yeah, four, 14, Rory won, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Phil won 13 at Muirfield. I can't even go to that place anymore. There's so many courses, Colin, that I go to, and I literally am like – bad painful memories in my stomach <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so that 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 uh, that, that happens there and he's like just yeah Muirfield's a tough one to even go to um so it was it was it, it that week and Rosie teed off and shot 71 in the morning and it was such a good round I mean one of the best rounds I've ever seen ever and we got done, went to have lunch, and then the wee Northern Irishman goes walking out. Wind has dropped. The skies have opened up. It's a beautiful day now and shoots like 63, and it wasn't even the same course, right? <laughs> I think Rosie hit like four iron into some hole that wrote, wrote, uh, Rory pitched sand wedge onto, and it was just – so that happened to him quite often where he just teed off at the worst time you could tee off. So that's what I think about the open championship. I like the most. I just feel like it's the most adversity in 72 yeah. holes. Yeah, it's good. It's tough, but that's everything for me, Sean. Um, really appreciate your time. Um, no, my pleasure. Dude. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. I did, I, I, did, I, did one of these, I did one of these earlier with Mike Beaumont. Yeah. So this is I'm, this is my week of of lockdown uh, seminars. <laughs> that is more of a chinwag than anything else. This one, but no, I really appreciate that, and um, all the best for this year. Okay, bud. Thanks, mate. No I'll problem. talk Take to care. you. See you later. Peace,